We're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about API development and consumption uh, in Azure App Plat because when we talk about integration, whether it's writing connectors or consuming connectors, whether it's about writing activities or consuming activities, ultimately it comes down to APIs. So the first chunk of this session will be really about how you do API development today, how it will be with the Azure uh, microservices platform, and then an opportunity for you to give feedback on, on possible gaps. Uh, then we'll dive into microservices specifically. I'll walk you through a demo where we do a Twitter sentiment analysis app, where I've written an app where I can periodically poll Twitter, submit a query string like Seahawks, submit it to Alchemy, which is a sentiment analysis engine, get back sentiment, and then send an email off via SendGrid. Uh, we'll talk about the architecture, uh, how it's really built on top of core Azure building blocks that already exist. And we're kind of closing some of the gaps with the microservices platform. And then we'll deep dive. And depending on time, I'll go through the entire deep dive or we can, we can reorder based on kind of where the room wants us to, to focus. All right. So talking about APIs, uh, data everywhere, increasingly in the cloud and on-prem. Uh, and much of, much, of the economy, much of the SaaS providers that are coming up today are actually fundamentally about APIs. APIs actually even trump the uh, web experience. SendGrid, case in point, Twilio, case in point. Really, the, the value they offer is through their APIs more than their front ends. Uh, but what we, we hear from customers, whether it be ASP.NET customers or BizTalk customers, it's really, really complicated to integrate all this stuff. If I want to build an app or if I want to build a workflow that starts with AD auth, Wiring that up is painful <laughs> just to get started. Now let's say I want that app that has authenticated the user with AD to call into Twitter, to call into Alchemy, to call into SendGrid. Suddenly that's a lot of uh, tokens I need to manage, a lot of refreshing I need to do, a lot of mapping between AD, AD identities and SaaS tokens I need to manage. A lot of stuff just to get a relatively basic scenario up and running. Uh, so for these reasons, you know, integration is really expensive and requires prof professional developers to implement uh, uh, the development stuff. So double-clicking on that, imagine writing an API today. We have a number of great assets in Azure today. We have Azure websites and mobile services, which are API hosting uh, offerings. And we have API management, which you can layer on top of either our own API hosting stories or third-party uh, SaaS offerings to give you an API management story. But as Bill mentioned in his talk yesterday, those are disparate offerings. They're, they're not really integrated offerings today. You have to do one and then follow it up by um, uh, using API management on top of it. So when we ask customers to speak about our current API hosting offerings, this is what we hear uh, from, the API, from the perspective of the API author. The first thing is the API author has his own concerns, even independent of what's going to happen downstream, whether it, uh, a different person deploys the API or whether a different person is going to be consuming the API, right off the bat, the API author has his or her own concerns. Uh, the first thing is, you know, I'm going to invest a lot of time writing an API. There really is, Microsoft doesn't really have a good ecosystem for me to, to, to kind of sell that and get value, get kind of some value back for all the work I've done to implement an API. The next piece is there's lots of manual plumbing that is above and beyond just my core business logic. Uh, logging. Uh, auth and SSO, if I want to call into Twitter, if I want to call into Salesforce, if I want to call into Alchemy, we don't really give you building blocks or starting points or connectors to be able to do that. We don't enable the community uh, or, or the ecosystem to provide connectors that API authors can use to handle auth and SSO. If I need to store secrets, if I need to store config, uh, those things are all up to the API author. And finally, update and versioning, likewise, is really up, for, up to the API author to plumb and, and manage. Those are things that the platform just doesn't provide for you out of the box. Then if you start looking downstream, there's needs that the API administrator in IT has that today the API author often has to be mindful of. Because again, API management is an additive piece, not something that's kind of integrated out of the box in our API hosting story. So the API author has to be mindful of the API administrator's needs, which can include governance, uh, monitoring of API performance, throttling, uh, rate limiting, et cetera. And then finally, if you uh, look even further downstream to the API consumer, one trend we're observing is API consumers are increasingly business users. Uh, and it's 
the bar for kind of user experience for consuming an API if you're a business user is much higher than, than it is for pro dev. And if I'm a business user, imagine I'm using BizTalk or I'm using some sort of design tool and I want to build that Twitter service we just talked about. You know, there, again, there's the AD auth going on plus there's three downstream SaaS services. How the heck can the business user without some sort of integration piece in the middle make sense of all of that, manage the credentials, flow the credentials? Uh, and this is left today for the pro dev to figure out and different pro devs who write stuff on our platform today will do it in different ways. So you don't really get a consistent experience if you're, uh, if you're uh, trying to target a business user as an API consumer. Uh, next piece is the ecosystem. Uh, if I am uh, a business user trying to build one of these apps or one of these workflows, it would be great if there was already an ecosystem of, of for example, SaaS connectors whether they be ones offered first party or, or, or third party that I could use to, to build my application. Uh, we talked about identity being difficult and fragmented and the business user doesn't want to know the details of centralized config and secret store. They just want to know that all that stuff, uh, stuff is working. So even with all the offerings we have today, there's a lot of pain as a pro dev to really hit the, you know, his or her own needs, the needs of the API admin and IT and the needs of the API uh, consumer. These pains resonate. Seeing some, some heads nodding, good. All right, so the Azure Microservices platform is our solution for addressing those pains we just talked about. It's just, it really addresses the building of APIs, the administration of APIs, and the consumption of APIs. And even though the center is on APIs, nothing we're doing precludes uh, business logic or websites living as part of the same microservices deployment. Because we hear often that, yes, I do want to deploy a bunch of APIs that work together to deliver a Twitter, um, a Twitter sentiment analysis app, but I also want the companion website that can live in the same deployment and inherit some of the same config, some of the same identity, some of the same shared secrets. Uh, but you know, our center, I would say, is around, uh, is around APIs to enable scenarios like BizTalk, uh, Workflow, and, and mobile. So double clicking one step further and then we'll go into a demo. Uh, the platform is made up of four key pieces. Uh, the first is a gallery. And the gallery will be a microservices gallery uh, visible independent of the Azure portal. That's really important for us and for, for our partners. We want it to be something that is accessible via the internet, via SEO, via Google. Uh, in addition to public gallery, we'll have private, we, we'll have private and organizational galleries too. So the gallery allows for both uh, connectors or, or, um, or activities that you want to publish globally, as well as connectors or activities that you want to publish within the scope of an organization. And there's two ways of publishing uh, uh, items into the gallery. The end user doesn't really know the difference, but from an author perspective, it is important. Uh, you can do codeless. So if you can declare what you want to do, entirely declaratively using a mix of API definition, uh, so API policy and, and a language like Swagger. You can build, for example, a Twitter connector or a Salesforce connector entirely without code. Uh, one example I like to use there is we've built a codeless Salesforce connector that takes, that builds sort of higher level APIs like get customer on top of more generic methods like query. So you can do all of that without code. You can offer a get customer method on top of a generic query method, offer throttling, rate limiting, et cetera, without having to write any code. Uh, having said that, uh, e even for the connector scenario, depending on what you want to do, you may need code. So certainly our gallery supports code-backed microservices. And if you have activities or transforms or things you want to write that go beyond what our codeless host offers, you can certainly write, write code. And I'll walk into the gallery in just a few minutes. Uh, the next piece is hosting. How many folks here have used Azure websites? Okay, about half, half the people here. So Bill, Bill mentioned yesterday uh, that the host for, the, the host for uh, microservices is Azure websites. Uh, and uh, and uh, which we're tentatively going to rebrand it to, to something like Azure App Container. Because really, the Azure websites has evolved to be a host for all kinds of things. Uh, websites, APIs, web jobs. Uh, the key thing is we're not inventing a new host. It's a rename, but it's the same host that we've been delivering for many years. There's about 400,000 active apps already running on Azure, uh, Azure App Container, uh, 300,000 unique, uh, uh, unique customers. 
uh, so a key principle for us here is to give BizTalk uh, customers a host, the same host that we've already been using across Azure for the last two years, not kind of have a siloed, a siloed hosting store. It's just the same host that we use across Azure. And anything you build, anything you build here can accrue to other scenarios above and beyond BizTalk 2, like native mobile apps. And likewise, from the ecosystem perspective, if you put something in the ecosystem here, it's something that might have value to customers above and beyond uh, BizTalk as well. Uh, and the other key point with the uh, app container host is any time we add value to the app container host, that automatically, uh, uh, automatically accrues here as well. So if you build a Twitter connector, uh, you can already take advantage of all the hybrid connectivity options that we have that Bill mentioned yesterday. If we add, as we add additional hybrid connectivity options or additional DevOps stories, all of those things are inherited automatically. So again, you, you get the benefit of one, with all of us focusing on one app container, all the value kind of accrues in one place. Uh, the next piece is the gateway. The gateway is a really key, key part of, techno of technology here. The gateway sits in between all inbound calls and your microservice or your backend, as well as all the components that make up your backend. So if you imagine that Twitter sentiment analysis um, microservice, you can imagine having some sort of composite microservice which in turn calls into a Twitter connector, which in turn calls into an Alchemy connector, which in turn calls into a SendGrid connector. So in between all those connectors and microservices, we have a gateway. And the gateway allows us to deliver a lot of the value that we talked about on the previous slide that are pains, pains today. Uh, the first one is security. So the gateway offers an identity broker that out of the box will understand or does understand 80 Microsoft accounts, Facebook, uh, Google, and Twitter and it's extensible. So we'll offer some set amount of identity brokers out of the box, but we offer the ability for the ecosystem to plug in other identity brokers. And the value here is if you're a microservices author, you don't need to implement AD auth or Facebook auth in your microservice itself. It's something that the gateway provides, uh, provides for you. Uh, likewise, the gateway provides SSO. Uh, there's two ways it can do this. The first way it can do this is if you've set up federation with, between AD and the uh, SaaS provider. The other way it can do this is we have a token store that's part of the gateway, and the connector is able to look at the token. The Twitter connector, for example, is able to look at the token store, pull out the Twitter token, and make calls into Twitter automatically. So if you're a consumer of the Twitter microservice, you don't have to be in the business of managing tokens for Twitter. That's, that's handled by the gateway for you. Obviously, if, you make, if your connector is making a call to Twitter, you do have to ultimately get the token and, and, and use the token to make the call. But if you call via the connector, that stuff is abstracted away for you. Uh, the next piece is the runtime. As I've alluded to, you can imagine microservices that are actually composite microservices that stitch together a bunch of other microservices. Uh, and likewise, you can imagine workflows that do something similar. So that there's a number of questions then, well, how do you do name resolutions? How does the Twitter composite microservice find the Twitter service? How does it find the um, SendGrid service? Those things are provided all by a runtime SDK that we offer. So the runtime SDK offers name resolution. It offers isolated storage. So you don't necessarily have to provision, a, do a heavy provisioning of a SQL database or a storage account if you want to do, um, do some relatively basic name value sort of storage. We offer shared config that's shared across all of the microservices in the deployment. And we offer an iDispatch. How many folks know what iDispatch is? Sign of my age, I guess. Um, but yeah, I, I, it offers an iDispatch like of experience on top of metadata that you provide with your microservice. And all that means is tools like Workflow are able to interrogate your microservice, see what APIs are available, see the shape of the APIs, see what auth mechanisms are required and then act on that accordingly. So if you publish a microservice, the, the uh, workflow can pick up on that. I see people half raising their hands. I was told to get through at least some content before fielding questions, so I, I'll, I promise I'll pause at a natural point and, and, and take a lot of questions. Uh, the final piece is the proxy. And I, think, I believe you guys have a talk on API management later today. The proxy is basically bringing all of the value that's in API management into this gateway as well, and it's just there out of the box. And the proxy provides things like monitoring, governance, uh, test pages, all the stuff that API management provides. Uh, the third piece is a development story. So one of the principles we have with our development story is that the core platform is relatively unopinionated. 
And that's, that's really important to us in order for the core platform to be able to serve a number of scenarios like BizTalk, Workflow, uh, mobile applications. Uh, so to that extent, really the only core requirement if you're exposing an API is that it be a REST-based API. You can optionally provide metadata, uh, Waddle, things like Waddle and Swagger. If you do, we understand them. We give, you the, we give you a test page on top of those. We give you the ability to um, uh, add permissions on top of those. But really at the core, these are web APIs. You can do file new in ASP.NET, create a web API, and publish that as a, as a microservice. Uh, you can optionally provide metadata, and the more you provide, the more helpful we can be. But at, at its core, these are really web APIs. And then on top of that, you, uh, on top of that we have the ecosystem. So if, if, if connectors want to impose additional requirements, whether it be OData or whatnot, that's totally, um, totally fair game. But the core platform is relatively unopinionated, and it gives the opportunity for different types of um, connectors or activities in the ecosystem to have, a, have best practice or opinions, if you will, on top of that. All right, so four, four key pieces. I'm going to walk into all of these in some more, more detail. And uh, this is an important slide that Bill showed yesterday. Uh, the microservices stuff I'm talking about today really is a core part of a refactored app platform. So Bill mentioned yesterday that we have five or six key services in the app platform that are somewhat siloed today. You can make them work together, but they're somewhat siloed. We're refactoring the app plat to be a more cohesive stack, and microservices are a key part of it. You can think of microservices as built on top of API management and the hosting story, and then things on top can include uh, cloud orchestration, web, uh, web and mobile, uh, mobile services. And a key point also from yesterday is certainly this will work in public Azure. It's also a key part of our Azure pack uh, offering for on-premises as well. And it allows for different permutations of hybrids. So you can have your entire microservices deployment living in public Azure, pointing back to on-premises resources like SQL. You can have your microservices deployment living on-premises, pointing to cloud resources, um, you know, or you can mix and let a mix and match. All right, so now we'll kind of start with a scenario, and I'll, I'll uh, dive into some demos. Uh, here's, that, here's our favorite Twitter sentiment uh, scenario again. Architecturally, the way I've built this is I have a composite microservice, which is a Twitter sentiment monitor, monitor and that's living in its own app container. That lives in its own Azure website or, or its own app container. I've, when I built that service, I said, hey, I don't really want to be in the business of calling it to Twitter directly. I don't want to be in the business of calling it to Alchemy directly. I don't want to be in the business of calling it to SendGrid directly. So what I did instead is I took a dependency on existing microservices that were available in the gallery. In this case, a Twitter search, uh, an Alchemy one, and a SendGrid one. And the value that these connectors provide on top of, say, the core services, and in this particular case, is really related to the auth flow. So when I call into this service, it's the thing that's smart enough to look into the token store, the microservices token store, pull out the Twitter token, find out if it's expired. If it has expired, it will do the refresh. I guess Twitter may be a bad example. I'm not sure if Twitter tokens expire, but um, to the, other ones, the other ones do. Find out if the token is expired, do a refresh, make the call onto Twitter. So the amount of code I had to write in my Twitter sentiment monitor is relatively light. It's really just focused on the business logic. I can assume that these connectors in the middle have done the magic of, of refreshing the token and, and, and retrieving the token from the token store, et cetera. And I can also assume that the identity broker, which sits, I, don't, I should have put it on this picture, but I can also assume the identity broker that's sitting in front of the sentiment, sentiment monitor has interacted with the end, end app, whether it be a workflow or a native mobile app, to get the Twitter token in, in the first place. So again, my app can really just focus on making the logical call to Twitter. I've done it without workflow. You can imagine the same thing being built with a workflow. One of our other principles is a workflow is a microservice. So you can chain together microservices like this, uh, or you can uh, describe a workflow definition. I've, I've done it without workflow. Okay, so we'll kind of walk through a scenario now. So there'll be different ways. There are different ways you can do microservice, um, kind of a start off deploying a microservice. Uh, we, ha we have command line stories. We have uh, an experience in the Azure portal. And we'll likely have other, um, other web experiences as well. I have picked an example where I start from the Azure portal. Uh, familiar? Have folks used the new portal? Do folks like the new portal? Okay. Uh, don't answer. Uh, 
So, um, but this is the new portal. The entire experience is going to be in the, in the new portal. So I say, I go to the Azure gallery in this particular case. I click it. Uh, there'll be a new category called microservices. And I can get a list of microservices that are either global. Uh, and what you don't see in this is you can also get microservices that are limited to your organization. Uh, in this case, I'm just showing global ones. So I'm going to go ahead and instantiate the social sentiment um, uh, microservice. All right, so now I'm going to actually flip to the real Azure portal to see what happened. Yeah. And again, a key thing here is this is like the Azure portal. This is not a BizTalk portal. This is not like a mobile services portal. It's the Azure, Azure portal. So we're, it's one, one back end across all of those, all of those pieces. I'm going to actually go back one step. So new Azure portal has a concept of a resource group. And the resource group is, is, is a logical grouping of stuff that you want to manage together. And when, when, I, when we deployed that Twitter microservice, by default, we put everything in a resource group. It just, it's kind of a natural fit between the concept of a resource group and the concept of a microservices deployment. So we use the same resource, resource group. Uh, concept and the the nice thing about the resource group is it lets you it's a unit of management. So if I want to say have RBAC rules on who's allowed to do management operations on the microservice, by us doing a resource group, you can do it. You can ACLE everything together by ACLing the the resource group. And and that's I'm, when I say ma uh, management there, that's distinct from the consumption side. We'll talk about consumption in a few minutes, but by the resource group is really about management, provisioning, provisioning microservices, deleting microservices, et cetera. All right. So I have gone ahead and created the resource group MVP summit demo. And a couple things you'll notice that are interesting. The first thing you'll notice is that spinning up that Twitter microservice actually created five websites, not one website. I know there were some questions in earlier sessions about in the, you know, how do, do we help you with, if, if you have sort of a composite microservice, do we help you provision everything? The answer is yes. We were, we, when, I, when we did that provisioning operation, we took the package, we deconstructed it, and provisioned all the websites for you. Uh, kind of another question I get is, wow, isn't that really expensive? Five websites, that seems like overkill for a Twitter sentiment um, uh, uh, analysis service. And I, I think that's the key thing that Bill's trying to emphasize yesterday with what an app container is versus the app host. All of these websites can run on the same VM. These are really just, think of these as process boundaries that can run on the same VM. Uh, the reason that we have them as distinct websites or distinct app containers is isolation. Because you can imagine some of these are third, so, so this particular microservice could be a mix of third party you know, and first party code. By us putting them in separate websites or separate app containers, you know, you know that they can't stomp on each other. Uh, and you know that the isolated storage for a particular app container is, is its, uh, its isolated storage. Obviously, if you have shared config, they can stomp on, on the shared config by design. But you know you have that isolation, at least, between, uh, between uh, containers. Okay, so now if I double click on the websites, let me go ahead and actually expand this, maximize Blade. Okay, let's see why I have five websites here. The first one is the proxy. So we deploy the proxy right into your, um, it's, not a, it, it's not a shared service. It's something that actually gets deployed right into your subscription, right into your, your resource group. And the reason for this is this is something you can manage, you can control. You can deploy on-premises. It's, it's, it's something you can control the update pace of, et cetera. So that's the proxy. Then you'll see we have the composite service, the Twitter sentiment monitor microservice. And then we have the three, um, the three services that uh, the Alchemy text analysis service, the demo proxy site, and the demo send grid service that make up that are being called by that. Those are the connectors. Those are the, the three connectors that are being called by that composite microservice. And all of these things live in a resource group. If I click on one of these, you'll also see, let me go ahead. So I didn't, I didn't show you the full deployment experience, but I was prompted for configuration settings. 
you'll see that the configuration settings made them uh, made it down to the website. So let me go to settings. Property. Uh, settings, application settings, and don't look too carefully because you'll see my SendGrid credentials, but you'll see here that the SendGrid credentials were flowed down to my website as app settings using the same mechanism that Azure Web Sites already supports today. And you'll notice that the credentials for my other services, uh, in this case, Alchemy and uh, Twitter, are not here. So this process only has access to SendGrid credentials. It can't act on my behalf to Twitter or, um, or Alchemy. All right, so now to see what, uh, not, not let's actually use this service. So I'm gonna to flip to uh, Postman. Uh, Postman is just a simple tool for making, making HTTP calls. It's similar to curl. Until recently, they only had a story in, in uh, Chrome, so that's the one I happen to have at the moment, but they've recently launched a standalone version two. So you'll see here I've loaded in some HTTP requests to different parts of my microservice. The first one is a request to the, to the gateway or the proxy. So you'll see here that I'm, everything in my deployment gets the same URL, MVP Summit uh, Demo Proxy Site, which is a bad name, but that's what I happen to pick. Then by, via namespacing, I can, <clears throat> I can say I want the proxy. And then I can say which microservice within my gateway I'm calling. And then the rest of it is just how I've chosen to implement my API. So in this case, I'm saying I want to call it the Twitter sentiment API that's part of the Twitter sentiment monitor microservice. I want to see what people are thinking about Seahawks right now. And one of the values that the, the microservice provides is caching. So it's not gonna, if, if, if this, API gets bombed multiple times with the same query, it's not gonna make the request over and over again. So I'll go ahead and hit send. I hope there's more positive sentiment than negative. Okay, so say so yeah, that's good. Seahawks are doing well again. So seven, seven positives, three negatives, five, uh, five neutrals. Now the interesting thing is if I were to make the same, if I were to make a call on one of these internal microservices, you'll see I'm gonna get access denied. So let me do Twitter search. So I wanna bypass the gateway and sort of go right into one of those microservices. If I hit send, you'll see I get 403 forbidden. So when I deployed this microservice, uh, by default, everything is private and at deployment time, I can specify that certain endpoints are public, and I specified that the composite microservice uh, gets a public endpoint, but none of the internal microservices get a public endpoint. One thing I haven't shown in this demo is, is the identity broker piece. So as an alternative to making the composite microservice public, I could have said protected, and once you say protected, then you can say protected with ADE, protected with, with uh, MSA, protected with Facebook, you know, et cetera. In this particular case, I made it public anonymous. So anybody can make this call uh, to the gateway, but if you try to talk to the internal ones, it's, it's private. And I haven't shown you protected, but protected is supported as well. Okay. Uh, the final piece is you can protect at the level of an entire microservice or at the level of an endpoint. Uh, today we support Swagger and Waddle. So if you give us Swagger or Waddle, we can find your endpoints and then give you the more granular capability of saying, hey, I just want this endpoint of this microservice protected or, or public or private. And I've, I've used a Swagger in this particular example, so let me come back to this guy. And uh, I used ASP.NET Web API, and, and ASP.NET Web API has a package that you can download from the community called Swashbuckle, which automatically generates metadata for your Web API. So you can see if I try and use that here, I think it's Swagger API docs. Uh, let's do this one. And send. You'll see that my API is exporting metadata 
And this is the metadata that allows us to then be able to give you that granular, granular level of control. Like I want maybe just one method on my, or one operation on my Twitter microservice to be public. How many folks have used, heard of Swagger? Waddle? OData? Okay. Any favorites? Yeah, we're, they're really, the, the truth be told, there really is no definitive standard for this yet. Uh, we've seen the most momentum with Swagger, so that's, that's been our biggest focus, but we also support Waddle, and we're taking input on the importance of, uh, of OData. I'll do a couple slides of architecture, then I can take a few minutes of questions in the middle, and then we'll do some deep dives in, in areas. It's a unified host. We, we kind of beat this point many times. It's a unified host across the board. Uh, here's a pictorial version of what we just talked about. So imagine you've written a microservice, put it in the gallery, and now one of your customers is deploying it. The deployment model here is, is sort of similar to what it is for BizTalk's server, in that when the customer deploys it, your microservice or your series of microservices get deployed in the customer subscription. They don't get deployed in sort of a, central, a centrally administered subscription. So if you write a Twitter microservice, uh, Acme deploys it, that Twitter microservice is now running in the customer's subscription. Uh, having said that, we have a number of channels to give you analytics and crash reporting back as the author, even though the code is not running in your own subscription, it's running in the customer subscription. Kind of a really, really important point. So it's, it, 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 it is sort of similar to the BizTalk. The deployment model is sort of similar to how BizTalk server works today. And having said that, there's nothing that precludes a customer um, from deploying a bunch of microservices and sharing them within the same organization. Um, but in that case, it's still not in your subscription. These things are running in the customer subscription, either an individual or an organization. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So you again, these 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 are running as Azure websites. So to the extent that Azure websites supports VNets or hybrid gateways, any of any of your microservices inherit uh, inherit that. Uh, so pictorially, what we have here is uh, we have an authoring and publishing experience in Visual Studio and a command line experience that's cross-plat and cross-language. So you don't have to use Windows. You don't have to use .NET. Uh, uh, when you're ready with your API, you package it up, publish it to a gallery. The gallery, again, can be a public gallery or an organizational, uh, organizational gallery. I know at Microsoft, MSIT is, is working in a number of uh, microservices on top of our um, various kind of uh, line of business and, and um, offerings that will then enable teams downstream to build mobile apps or workflow or uh, on top of those things. So the organizational gallery is a really important piece as well. Uh, that syncs with the, and that's a gallery, to the public gallery has its own web page, SEO friendly. The organizational gallery can also have its own web page, but obviously that web page is, is protected um, behind organizational credentials. Uh, that syncs with the Azure Marketplace. So the Azure Marketplace is what we just saw in the, uh, in the portal where I showed you a list of microservices. So that, that makes the microservices available right inside Azure. And then that projects it to the Azure portal. And then when I deploy a microservice, I end up with a resource group. And the resource group includes the gateway, which I showed you in the portal. It includes microservices that are backed by code. It includes microservices that, are, that don't have code. It can include workflow definitions, uh, mobile services, which I'm not going to talk about too much today, but Azure mobile services will also run as a microservice, and custom code. We hear a lot from customers that they also want the com what, what's called a companion website to run inside the same deployment and get access to the same shared config, uh, get, get a, be protected behind the same identity, identity broker. And one, the, one other really interesting part with all of this is you can optionally provide an Azure resource manager or template. So if your microservice needs additional dependencies, 
uh, like a, a SQL database or a storage account, those will automatically get provisioned when your microservice is, is uh, provisioned. Yeah, having said that, you know, we've tried to put a fair amount of functionality right into the runtime so that when customers are deploying these things in their own subscriptions, they don't need to spin up a, you know, they don't need to wait a long time and, and burn a lot of money with a bunch of other Azure services. So, you know, again, we mentioned isolated storage. That's something that we've just plumbed right into the runtime. But you have the flexibility, um, which is nice, uh, when you spin up a connector or when you spin up an uh, um, activity to bring in other Azure services if you, uh, if you need them. And then this resource group can certainly, I'm sorry, this resource group can certainly talk to, um, can certainly talk to both on-premises and third-party um, third party SaaS offerings. Basically anything that has an endpoint it can talk to. And on-premises stuff can be protected or routed to using all of the hybrid connectivity options that Azure Web Sites supports today, including VNet and hybrid connections. And then I guess the final piece is, is the gateway is just a REST endpoint, so it it's, can be consumed by BizTalk and Workflow, but certainly web, web applications and desktop applications can use, uh, use the same thing too. Okay. And the key, key value here with the gateway is with all, in, all inbound calls and all calls between microservices uh, go through the gateway. Uh, so Again, we talked about runtime, proxy, identity broker, uh, and these in turn also talk to other services, isolated storage, shared config, and a, and a secure token store. Uh, with BizTalk, we used to have something like a BizTalk message, and that's like the common context, contexts, you know, with the, with the content and things like that, multi-part even, that we flow from one component to the others. Here it's more, let's say, JSON-based, um, how do you see, you know, flat files and, and even binary files moving between all those microservices? Is, will you provide a vehicle like Bistalk message as JSON, or do we have to, you know, write that ourselves? That's not clear yet for me. Yeah, so the question is, if I want to flow a message, message between things, uh, will we provide helper classes? Uh, again, the core platform is not prescriptive, so I can show you a code example where I'm just using system.net.hudp in my particular example and, and happen to use JSON. However, the connectors and the BizTalk services that Vivek and his team will be building on top of that will, will bring a lot of the concepts that um, BizTalk has today. So, so I'd say no on the core platform, but that doesn't preclude uh, classes of, of microservices that are in the ecosystem and adding best practice or patterns on top of that. I think Vivek can you know, speak better to those, those details.